Hello, my name is Leon Whitley. I'm pastor at Austin Grove Baptist Church. I want to thank each of you for uh, tuning in to our Wednesday night service. I hope this week finds you well and your family well. And I uh, just want to thank you for your faithfulness in, uh, uh, in uh, continuing to seek to walk closer and closer to our Heavenly Father, uh, even through difficult times. But yet our Heavenly Father is always there guiding us and uh, his word is, is truth. And that's truth above all. Uh, we're going to be continuing here uh, this evening uh, in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, if you have your Bible. I'm reading out of King James Version, and I invite you to turn or just listen with me, if you would. Now, Paul is writing to young Timothy, and he has entrusted Timothy to lead a congregation there at Ephesus. And uh, so listen with me here at verse 3 in chapter 6, 1 Timothy. Listen to these words. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now here's, uh, listen, these are the standards in which that Paul is setting forth in, the, in Timothy's mind and heart, but also in the life of the early church. Now he's listed this, these are the things that you need to be about. And if you're not using those, uh, using every part of your being, uh, to uh, carry forth the gospel of Christ uh, and be sure that you are adhering to godliness, not the things of the world or the direction that the world may lead you. Now look at, look at verse 4 uh, that Paul writes to Timothy. He said, if, if any man's teaching you otherwise, he is proud, knowing nothing, in other words, uh, Paul's very, he's cutting to the chase. He's really saying that uh, uh, sometimes we think a whole lot more highly of ourselves than we really ought to. And uh, the important and significant thing in our lives is that we are adhering to what God's word says and that, uh, uh, that we are listening to him and we're not doing things that are contrary to the doctrine of our Heavenly Father. And in verse uh, four, he says, this person's proud. He knows nothing, but he's doting about questions. You ever met individuals that all they've got is questions over and over? Jesus, uh, would, in dealing with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes, uh, many times they would come back at Christ and try to ask him questions, not with sincerity, not seeking to have and find answers, but they were seeking to uh, set Jesus up to where whatever he said, they were going to have an, uh, uh, an obvious answer to that was going to uh, put Jesus in a, uh, a, a bad light. And uh, they wanted things to be slanted their way. And uh, Jesus also would use questions. And I think the Holy Spirit still using questions even today in 2020 of talking to us. And uh, Paul's writing, he says, uh, he says, be careful that person that's feeling proud. That person in, uh, uh, that Paul says they don't know anything. And they're asking questions. But look at the next phrase where it talks about, the, uh, about questions. He says, there's strife in the words that they're using. There's traps there. There's a uh, undertone within their very words and their thinking uh, and their logic. It is that they're trying to cause strife. And uh, then look at the, some traits now that uh, uh, Paul's, Paul's telling Timothy. If these things are happening, uh, he says, here's what's going to come. He said, where of, in the last part of verse 4, where of cometh, now listen to what he says. Envy is going to come out of this. Strife is going to come out of this. Not peace that Christ is seeking to impart to us and that he's seeking that his word would give us uh, inspiration and direction for. And now notice the third word here he, he uses. He says there'll be railings. We'll have a tendency 
Uh, Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, if these things are happening in a person's or, or an individual's mind and heart, and uh, they're allowing this to go on, then it's ungodliness, and the direction in which their life's taken, it's going to cause railings. You're going to lash out at people. You're going to seek to do that which is in accordance with what you want, your desire, not God's desire. And uh, then he even uses this terminology, evil, submissive. Evil. Uh, you're either for God or you're not. Jesus very clearly made that uh, over and over again. There is only one way to heaven, and that's that narrow way. Uh, but he said, wide is that road that leads to destruction. That is whenever we use some of the terminology here, one that becomes very proud and uh, uh, Paul would very quickly say, this person doesn't know anything. And they're using all their faculties, not for good, not for godliness, not to do things that Jesus would seek to do, have them to do, but they would be doing things that would uh, serve them well and make the other person or persons to seem adverse to what God's word is saying. So it's really traps. I think, I think uh, this is really what Paul was warning young Timothy. Don't fall in the, and don't become a victim of these traps that the world sets for you and snares. Because Satan is going to do that for uh, you and I as believers because he knows he can't snatch us out of God's hand. But he knows that good well that he can, if he can get you and I to thinking, not in a Christ-like manner, but thinking uh, from a flesh matter that uh, uh, we may be able to, to exercise a little damage in this world, not, in the, not it, uh, uh, for the namesake of Christ, but we're doing it uh, for our own sake. And so it's certainly the furthest thing from doing that which is godly and that which that Jesus prescribed and said that we need to do. Now look with me at verse 5, if you would, please. Uh, verse 5 says, There are perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth. Destitute, it's literally, that means there's, there's nothing there. Uh, it's void. It's void of really what truth is. Satan is void of real truth. Satan does not desire for truth to ever come out in any shape or form. He's seeking for the truth that will be suppressed or it will be uh, put to the side, not to be picked up, certainly not to be proclaimed. Now look at the middle part here of verse five, if you would, here as we continue. Supposing that gain is godliness. Now look at what he says that, that the response, what Paul says to Timothy, that response should be. From such, withdraw yourself. You know that's going on, and you and you see that happening. Don't be a part of it. Uh, get yourselves away from it. Uh, I know one of the things we tried to tell our kids that uh, as they were growing up as teenagers, uh, when they began to take upon themselves responsibilities of making decisions, that it sometimes that we're going to be even bigger decisions than they should ever have to make. That we always told them if they ever get in a position that they're uncomfortable or a position in which that they uh, really didn't know where to turn and they needed a way out, blame mom, blame dad, call us, no questions. We'll talk about that the next day uh, and we'll be right there to help you. In other words, what we were telling our, our kids was when you when when you're approached by th things that you know that are not right, they're not right in a parent's eyes or a grandparent's eyes, but more importantly, they're not right in God's eyes. That it's you and I, we need to not be afraid to flee, to get away as fast as you can. 
Let's, look, let's listen as we continue on now, he says. Withdraw yourself. Now look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment, and listen to these last three words here. But godliness with contentment, not might be, not could be, but he said, it is great gain. Who's it gain for? It's gain for you and I. God gives us his words to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to give us direction, to give us the courage to, when need be, to turn and to flee, to get away. But let me reread verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, why would he say contentment? He would say that because when there's an uneasiness and when there is a disregard uh, for saying thank you, Jesus, for the, all the things that you have given to us, uh, then you and I, we need to be very, very careful. And the Bible talks about uh, if you're not, if, if there's an uneasiness and there's a stirring within deep within your soul to where you're, you're not uh, focusing like you know you can and like you know you should, then uh, be cautious because you're treading a fine, fine line that will take you a lot further uh, in the wrong direction away from Christ than uh, than you ever intended to go. See, this is what Satan sells us this big lie that this time will not hurt. This is this moment, this decision. It's not going to be big. It's not going to be instrumental. It's not going to be huge in your life. Yeah, this is what the draw for drugs or alcohol in, in an individual lives. It, it, certainly this is not. This is not going to be an, an issue. You can handle it. You're a big, you're a big man. Uh, 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 you're a mature man or woman. Uh, you can handle this. That's what Satan wants to tell us. You and I know in full well that we better flee. We better run. But Satan finds great joy in uh, throwing out temptations into the hearts and lives of believers who uh, we find ourselves, the flesh, calling out to us and uh, wanting you and I to, uh, uh, to give the flesh credence over what the Word of God says, what real truth is. And this is what, the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about truth. And truth uh, can be found, cannot be found anywhere else other than God's word. That is truth that can be counted on, that you and I can trust, that you and I are able to let God's will be done in, in each of our lives. Now, I, I, I love how clearly Paul puts verse 7. And I think every one of us need to take that to heart. Look with me at verse 7. And he says, For we, Paul included himself, he includes Timothy, he includes all who are listening, he includes all throughout generation after generation that are going to be able to read and study this word. And to read this uh, uh, letter that Paul would write to Timothy, he said, For all of us, or for we, brought nothing into this world. We didn't. We came from our mother's womb. God gives us life. But look at the last phrase here, verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, listen to what Paul said. He said, you're not going to carry this with you. Nothing's going to be able to be taken from this world. The only thing you and I are going to take from this world is Jesus Christ. That is within the depth and heart of our soul. Uh, the things of this world, we're not. We all hear that amusing story that says that uh, that the husband and wife, they had devised and they had amassed great wealth and they had uh, amassed that 
that whoever went first would take uh, half of what they had uh, had amassed or had had uh, generated in their lifetime. And the plan was that uh, the last one to pass away <clears throat> would bring the rest. I'll promise you, I have conducted a tremendous amount of uh, memorial services and funerals, and never have I seen a, a uh, armored vehicle uh, or U-Haul truck uh, follow us to the graveyard. Paul emphatically told Timothy and the early church, and he's telling each of us here in 2020 that you brought nothing into this world. The only thing you're going to take away is Jesus Christ, nothing else. All these other things, they're just that. They are things. They are things of this world. Those are things that are not going to enter the gates of heaven. They're not needed. They're not required. And God will not allow the, those things to come. He will, and he and he alone, through his precious son, Jesus Christ, will carry us from this life to eternal life. And that, folks, is what really matters at the end of one's life, not the things that we have amassed. There comes a time when the things that we thought were so very, very important that we should acquire not just the small amount, but more and more and more, only to find that when God calls your name or my name, those things, they have no credence whatsoever. They have no importance. They have no significance for what really matters is that you know Jesus Christ. I've sat by the bedside or in the home or the hospital or near one. I have yet to hear someone in their last breath saying, let me hold something of that of the monetary value or money or whatever. No. When you reach that point, you and I better be sure that we know Christ as Lord and Savior. The money, the items that we have accumulated, that we value and that we treasure and that we hold in such high esteem upon this earth, they're vanity. They're meaningless in heaven. So Paul, Paul says very clearly, he said, we brought nothing in, in, into this uh, world and it's certain that we can carry nothing out, that nothing's going to be able to come out. Look at verse 8, and we'll, we'll get ready to close here shortly. And having food and raiment, let us therefore be content. You know, tonight, and this day, there are a lot of families from those that are elderly, those that are middle-aged, those that are young, and those that are very young, our children, throughout the United States, but also the world, that this, this day, this night, their bellies are empty. They've done good if they got part of a meal today. We saw evidence of food pantries uh, filling up places where food pantries were never even thought about. And food uh, distributions have been done during this uh, uh, uncertain times that we have been are living in. There's such a tremendous need. And certainly it's, it's good that we're trying our best to meet that need and to minister to people uh, because Jesus would remind us uh, uh, through his holy scripture, through his words, uh, that if you've done it to the least of these, my brother, he said, you have done it unto me. So it is important, folks, that as, as there is needs that arise, 
uh, whether they're next door to us or in our, in our uh, communities or in our county or state or in our world, we need to do the very best that we possibly can to minister, to take care. And, uh, but Paul reminds them, listen, if you've got uh, food in your belly and you've got clothing on your back, look at the last phrase here, verse 8. Let us be there with. And look at the last word. Let us be content. You've heard me say many times, thank you, Jesus. We need today in 2020, on this Wednesday night, and I, and I, I know I know that uh, uh, those of you that I know, I know that you're thankful for what God has given to you, and you're thankful for the blessings that God has poured out in your life. You're thankful for the good health and all these other things that God has associated and has brought into your life and in my life. So we, we need not forget to say thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We give, we've given out a number of these thank you, Jesus signs, and you'll see them scattered all about our community here and around Marshall and Winget. You'll see a lot of those signs that are out. I'm grateful that we had the privilege of being able to to get that message out. Thank you, Jesus. That's what Paul was really trying to say to say to Timothy and all the others. If you've got uh, if you've got food food in your belly and you've got clothes on your back, uh, you need to be thankful. You're blessed. You are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed people here in the United States and in other nations of the world. But at the same token, I know that there are there are places in which that uh, there are hungry people. They're hungry for physical food and nourishment that that food will provide. And I think also in that there is a hunger for the gospel, for the simplicity that Jesus made it so that even a child could understand. If you're listening to my words here tonight, let me encourage you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he invites you to come. I invite you, but my invitation, my words will pass away. But Jesus is saying, I love you so much. Won't you open up to me? Won't you give your heart and, and life to me? Simply ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him for forgiveness of your sins, for all of us have sinned. And we miss the mark, we fall short of deserving eternal life. But Jesus said, if you will confess your sins to me and ask me for forgiveness and believe that I am the Son of God, he said, in no wise will I cast you out, but I'll open up and I will receive you into myself. Because the gift that I bring and I want you to pay close attention to that. This is a gift that Jesus Christ is still bringing to this world. He brought it over 2,000 years ago. But I'm convinced he's still bringing it into your life and my life and into the life of others. And if you do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit, right now, he's bringing that message to you. I love you. I will forgive you your sins. Ask. Jesus would use terminology. Uh, he'd say, uh, knock, the door will be open to you. Ask and you shall receive. So let me encourage you to do that very thing. Paul's encouraging Timothy, but I think also Paul's encouraging you and I today in 2020. I hope this uh, remainder of this week is a, is a good week for you. I pray that for God's safe keeping of you and for good health for each of you. We're going to try to get back in, uh, in a limited way uh, in our church uh, services next week, but we'll still continue to come to you online if you're joining with us. We'd love to have you. If you're not affiliated with a church uh, anywhere and you live close uh, by where our church is, we'd love to have you. And uh, let me take this time just to say, uh, we we would love for you to come and be a part of our fellowship and to visit with us. You'll find a very warm, caring congregation that will reach out to you and will embrace you.
but more importantly, you, you're going to find a G you're going to find Jesus and you're going to feel the warmth of his touch and hand upon your life. Bow with me here. If you would, as we close heavenly father, I thank you, Lord, for this day and the blessings you've granted to us. Father, I thank you the words that Paul wrote to young Timothy and to others. And Father, I know that here, here today, he's writing to me and to each person that's listening here. If there are those that do not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that this is the hour, this is the time that he or she will uh, open up and will ask for forgiveness and that they may be saved. That Father, that and that when that time comes, when they're going, to, when you call their name, they don't have to be concerned about all, all these things. But Father, they're going to leave here with Christ at the very center of their souls and hearts. So, Lord, thank you for your blessings you poured out upon us. Take care of us, keep us safe. Hear the prayer requests uh, that are in our church family as well as others. Hear the unspoken needs. Those that loved ones have gone on to be with uh, you in heaven, Father. Be with those families that are left behind. Grant them strength and encouragement day in and day out. And Lord, we'll always be careful that we give you honor, praise, and glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week and may God bless you.